Okay. And we are live. Yay. So good to be alive. Um, and I am here with the wonderful Kidlit author, Heather Montgomery. Heather, welcome. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. This is a great place to be today. And and, and we are, we are, well, we aren't any, I mean, you don't want to be here in Israel in the middle no. of a war. So I would Hearing, conversation. Hearing conversation. Hearing ah, okay. conversation. You're, you're somewhere, where are you? In Alabama, Mississippi? Where are you? <laughs> I live in Alabama. My address is Alabama, but I'm literally on the state line with Tennessee. So I also have a Tennessee address. It's crazy living on a border. Yeah. Okay. And um, so I would rather be where you are, but I am where I am. Um, anyway, it, we have to introduce the program. So I'm Mel Rosenberg, and I'm the, what am I, the host of the Children's Literature Channel of the New Books Network. And I am here with celebrated, award-winning, multi-author, Heather Montgomery. Welcome, Heather. And, Thank and, you. And you're I'm... celebrating a new book that just came out three weeks ago. Brand new book, sick. Yes, it was this last week that I got to launch it and visited thousands of kids at many schools. Um, so exciting to get to share science with kids in a way that's fun and engaging. And gosh, I wish there were books like this when I was a kid. So um, yeah, now's the time to show the people who are watching because it's also a podcast. Uh, by the way, everybody run out and buy this book. Uh, if you are um, a hypochondriac, buy 10 books. Yeah. And, and, and if, if you're not, you will be after you read it. Heather, so go ahead. Talk about the book, The Illustrator, at Bloomsbury, your agent. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, this crazy book came out at the beginning of the pandemic. I mean, came to me at the beginning of the pandemic. I didn't know it was a book, of course. Um, but like everyone on the planet, we we wonder what was going to happen to the humans. Um, and uh, when I need answers, I go to the woods and animals. Animals have answers for me, right? And so out there I am hiking along and... It just dawns on me that every species, plant and animal around me, has survived their own pandemic. I mean, those are the ones that are left on the planet, right? And that was such a big idea and hopeful, right? Recognizing that that's, that's what it's about. And, and then, of course, I started to wonder, well, how? You know, how did those squirrels survive when they get sick? And, and so I went to the scientists and uh, I found these amazing stories. And I thought this was going to be a book about just, you know, fun facts because uh, immune systems are awesome. Um, but then I recognized that the story of the science was really an important piece to tell because it's not one and done, right? And we learn a little bit and then we learn some more and then we learn, oh, maybe we weren't 100% right, but we got this from this study. And then the next day, so the book became chapters of different scientists studying different species um, and, and how they survive from behaviors like chimps um, who literally use the forest as a pharmacy um, all the way down to the very intricate of the immune system. Um, and I thought it was a picture book. Oops, I was wrong. <laughs> I, I often do this. I think a book is one thing and then it shows me differently because I knew I had to have illustrations. I knew I wanted to show this uh, this amazing body, you know, all these bodies in, in, in the ways that they work. Um, and I wanted to show the process of, say, the immune system and how it works. But I also wanted to show science as sequential. Um, and so I wondered if I could write this book. Well, pieces of the book came to me in sequential art. Like I just saw them. And I'm not a person who ever loved reading comics um, and graphic novels, but that's just the way the book came to me. And so, man, I was so fortunate. Lindsay Lee, I had an amazing, I have an amazing editor, Megan Abate, who connected me with Lindsay. And, and Lindsay just gets me. Right. It's just somehow she understands my sense of humor with like all these things happening in the book where we're blasting the back. It's like it's like you guys are sisters, you know, you're writing and uh, you get this um, blast of a of an illustration that seems yeah. to go hand in glove yeah. with the text. And that's, She's that's got a uh, great science background. And that I think is amazing. So when I write, I can't help but teach. Like that's just who I am. I want it to be fun and silly and humorous. 
and engaging. Um, and I don't understand why teaching can't be that way because that's what science is. I mean, we're all curious people, right? And so um, I think we're, we're, that- we're, we're curious people in several ways. We're curious <laughs> people and we're curious people. Exactly. Um, and that's what makes life interesting, right? Um, so uh, yeah, I, I'm really delighted with the art. Um, so so I, I, I love this book on several levels uh, because of the text and the illustration. Um, and there's something else because I am a microbiologist. Um, so uh, what I liked in particular was that you didn't say, this is the way it is, this is the way it is. You said, here, these are the scientists. This is what they're studying. These are the hypotheses that they're trying right. to, to refute or to establish. And um, I think that all nonfiction should be written like this because basically so much of science turns out to be wrong uh, or partly wrong. And uh, what you've done is that you've, brought out the human element, that these are scientists working on hypotheses that, that may turn out, may not turn out. Uh, and if they don't turn out, then there's going to be another hypothesis. Right. And, it, and it's such a challenge, right? Because I was taught from a textbook and textbooks make you think that they're right. Um, and it's not that science is wrong. It's that science is growing. Our scientific knowledge is constantly growing. And that's awesome. And one of the things that, that this book brought out to me is technology's role. And of course, we know that technology has a role in growth of our, our understanding. But wow, wow. So it was just amazing to see how our thoughts um, and dig back into the history of like bacteria and, you know, what we what we considered to be bad versus good. And now we have a way different understanding of microbiomes and stuff which is so awesome but to see it actually kind of play out in the history of the science absolutely absolutely and uh on a personal level i have a manuscript on uh, on bacteria so i was a little uh, i was in trepidation when i uh, approached you and uh, and i uh, read your book and thank goodness uh, i took another tack so uh, we're not uh, you're not you're not my comp if my book ever gets published, and that is uh, assuring. Um, when and, uh, when it's, your it's book ever gets published, I have to change that. I have to interrupt you and say it's when your book gets published, not if your book gets published. Yeah, from your lips to uh, whoever's hearing. Um, <laughs> but um, this uh, this interview is about you, and um, it's 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 a great book, uh, highly recommended. And like you say, it's a picture book, but it's not like for five year olds. Right. It's packed with illustrations, but yeah, I um, I actually find that I get a lot of adult readers of my um, middle grade nonfiction um, because I write to the, maybe the fifth grader, you know, but we're all kids inside of us, right? And there's so much complex science that although we might've been introduced to it in school, we don't get it. And, and all of a sudden, when it's relevant in our lives, we want to learn more, right? Um, I had immu immunology in college and it was a great course, awesome course, but it wasn't my favorite. I didn't really dig into it until I wanted to write this book because all of a sudden I wanted to know, you know, camels, camels have this phenomenal nano bodies, these amazing antibodies that like we are now using to combat COVID, right? And we're looking at them for cancer and for attacking pollution. And and how are their bodies able to do that? You know, I want to know these things. So, uh, cool. so it, it, it's it's incredible, and uh, and it's out by Bloomsbury. And uh, I wish you tons of luck with this book. Um, Thank you. And it, one of the things when I was thinking, how do I introduce you? You are it, you're an yucky, yucky author. And if I say that about most people, they would. Uh, they would, you know, they would take offense. But I think that you like to be a yucky author. Well, the thing is, we're all fascinated by the gross stuff, right? I mean, it's gross and disgusting, but yet it's fascinating. And 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 most people think that it can't be both. But to me, it is because um, it's bodies and it's things that we're interested in and we're curious. And we're naturally repelled by it, which is good because that keeps us clean. I tell kids, you know, like your gross ick that you feel inside you. That's a good thing. Don't ignore it. Right. But you make a choice as to how you deal with it. Right. 
every time you have an emotion, you're choosing how to handle that emotion. And it gets the same way. And yes, put your gloves on. Yes, wear your mask. Yes, put your goggles on when you do dissection. But that doesn't mean that we can't also be totally entranced by what's going on and understanding these things that we can't see, I think are even more compelling. I mean, it's hard to talk about and kind of get into, but we're also fascinated that right on our skin, there's so much going on right now, you know, in our, our eyelids. This was, this was my career for, for decades, so absolutely. Know, right? <laughs> let, 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 let's go. So so you have books on poop and you have books on roadkill and, um, you know, some of your, uh, yeah, and um, <laughs> and it's a, it's a great career. We're going to get to that in a minute. Uh, but sometimes, once in a while, I interview an author who's written a book that I love. And uh, your book, uh, What's in Your Pocket?, is a book that I'm going to run out and buy. Uh, the idea behind it is brilliant. Um, the execution is brilliant. Um, tell us about this one too, please. Yeah, let me talk about this one because as a writer, I learned a lot from writing this book. So there was a period in time when editors were asking for lots of picture book biographies. Not currently, but at one point they were. And, you know, I didn't write biography. I write science. And honestly, history, not really my jam. So when editors actually suggested to me, Heather, come on, you could do a picture book biography of scientists. Wouldn't that be great? And I'm like, eh, mm, 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 no. And then, uh, you know, it, it took a while. And then I got another suggestion that I should do this. And I'm like, oh, geez. okay, so I go to the library and I read tons and tons of science biography, biographies. I'm like, mm -hmm. Um, not my thing except in every single one of them I recognized there was like one little scene that I loved and the scene always seemed to be when the kid was getting in trouble I mean but to me as a science educator it was the scene where I saw wait wait that kid is that kid is developing their science skills and I just wondered I was like I just like think to do things differently I think I was like could I write like sort of semi-biography with just like one scene from their life and that's what it became like I think about how now, where, where did you get this idea this brilliant genius idea to look at okay. scientists as children um collecting things like like I know all about the Darwin's a uh, uh I would say his compulsion mm -hmm. to collect everything I've been in his house he collected everything um right. but but to get that idea to look into the pockets of people who became famous afterwards is brilliant. Yeah, you know, sometimes the title comes uh, uh, late or early, um, and, and sometimes the title just really gets it, and, and this one does. You know, what's in your pocket? Collecting nature's treasures. It's really what it's about, but it's really developing your skills. So one of the reasons I think that this book came to me is I do a lot of environmental education with families or schools. And one thing that frustrates me more than anything is I'm going up down the trail with a bunch of kids and a kid picks something up and the adult says, don't touch that. And I'm like, wait, what? They have to touch it. I understand, like to me, I'm kids, I have to touch stuff to learn, right? Um, and I understand sometimes things are dirty, sometimes things don't need to be picked, all of those reasons, but we still need to touch things. Um, and so I remember you know, as a child, putting things in my pocket. I, and and so part of this book is a reaction to that, to help show the adults, I think the book is much, much for adults as it is for kids, that these things that mm, may not always be our favorite things that kids do, that we need to value the learning that is happening within those things. We need to help teach them ways in which they can collect safely for themselves, but also for the environment. Um, and I, I liked that in the back we got to include my collection rules for myself like all the stinky stuff stays on the porch <laughs> um but but really it was reading widely of lots and lots of biographies and every time just seeing this one little one little thing and there were lots of stories that didn't get in the book um so then I had this great collection of scientists they became scientists, but as a child, they did something. They put something in their pocket. They brought it home. It exploded in the parlor. They kind of got in trouble, but not really, you know, and they had to empty their pockets on the porch. But 
that was just a list. And I sort of have this problem because a lot of sciencey ideas come to me are lists. Lots of examples of something that help me understand, you know, what's what's going on in that scientist's mind. So I submitted it to uh, Charles Bridge and had an editor, fantastic editor, who really wanted it and, and acquired it. But she was like, so what? Because I had this list that was in a sequence in my mind that made sense, but it didn't, she's not a science educator. She wasn't seeing what I was seeing in these examples. Um, and so she helped me. This book has a refrain and it's a building refrain, right? It, um, it didn't have this to start with. Um, and so that's what's really good about a great editor is they ask you good questions and they don't tell you what to do but they ask a question that allows you to kind of open your mind to that and i knew that you know refrains were great in in picture books and repetition is always a good thing but i didn't see the need and she helped me understand that she wasn't seeing the building building blocks that i was did we, did we mention her name it's worthwhile sorry yes Alyssa Pusey, she's a fantastic editor. Um, and Charles thanks. Bridges is, of course, wonderful. Um, yeah, and so, Charles Bridge. Yeah, go ahead. I was say Charles Bridge really uh, works well for me because, or with me also, but because a lot of their books have a lot of educational content, but they're not textbooky, and so they walk this line that I seem to walk on the balance of school versus entertainment, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so you, you, you touched upon reader response, which, which is so important, you know, that the author might mean one thing, but, but um, if, if he or she or they are successful, then um, the readers can infer other things. So here's an example of reader response. So you got me thinking about all the hobbies that famous people had when they were, when they were children and not necessarily in science. And, um, and and because I, I teach young people to have hobbies and, and your book made this so clear to me, you know, here are all these people um, and, and, and looking at myself and say, you, you moron, why didn't you see that? You know, when you were in Charles Darwin's house and you saw his minerals and beetles and butterflies and, and whatnot. Um, and, and, and birds and pigeons and, uh, he, and, and, and shales, and he, he collected everything. Um, so, so that's wonderful. I, I want to take you now to, um, as, as I like to do in my interviews, uh, who is Heather? Tell us about your life and how you became an author. Um, your, your agent is, is Ruben Pfeffer, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, um, maybe. Yes, in, in his, I'm in his agency, but now um, Amy, Amy, Amy Thrall Flynn is covering my oh. work. So yeah. So Ruben, okay. um, Ruben sold sick. Um, but I'm working with Amy now, and I think that's a, a, a great match. Um, so me, how yeah. I got there. Um, yeah. Uh, I was a nature kid, outside as much as possible, climbing trees all the time. Still climb trees because they're awesome. Um, I didn't get it that my passion was science. I thought my passion was animals and I didn't connect science to animals until seventh grade, which I think is really sad. You know, I didn't understand that science was amazing, awesome, and the way into understanding animals. So I guess that's one of the reasons I write these books is I wanna help kids figure that out earlier. Um, so I got a BS in biology um, and uh, a master's in environmental education. Uh, because I found through being an interpreter at a, at a state park and working at a camp that teaching about nature and connecting kids to animals and wildlife was just the best thing in the world. It just filled me up. And so um, when I finished graduate school, there was an environmental center beginning its uh, journey. And so it's called Camp McDowell Environmental Center down here in Alabama. And I, I, I read about it, and it's fantastic. And one of the things that really um, I want to ask you about this is 
it's actually a part of a church. It's part of the Episcopalian ministry. And a few words on that, because like it's the first time I've heard of a um, of, of, of something that's like nature, but it's also religion. Um, and uh, tell us about that. That's yeah. very interesting. So the center itself is not a religiously affiliated organization. The center is um, a separate organization housed at the camp. Camp McDowell is Episcopalian. However, um, the Episcopal Church really sees this as part of, of uh, stewardship, which I agree. Um, and so it's really fascinating. Um, so there's a, a summer camp. And they saw that their camp was sitting empty the rest of the year, not on weekends, but like weekdays. And so they were like, well, this is a classroom. Let's let it be a classroom. And it's fabulous. There are um, a number of centers all across the U.S. Alabama has very few. And so I was very glad to come and start get that one started and uh, work there till 2000 as a director. And later I came back in a kind of part time role. Uh, because it's just who I am, like getting kids in the creek, up a canyon, putting their hands on it, you know, that's that's the way to learn. Um, I'm kind of sort of spoiled now. Uh, after that, uh, I tried to teach in the classroom for a while, but, you know, it's just not the same. Um, I did a few other things, but for a long time I couldn't figure out what to do with myself. Like, all I wanted was to connect kids to nature and connect more and more kids. And and I, I didn't I didn't know how to do that differently. And so I was in the bookstore and you know what? I was always in the kids section of the bookstore. And I don't have children, so I wasn't buying books for them. And I do buy gift books, but I was like you know what's this about like why and I just recognize the kids books are the best books because they leave out the boring right like a kid's book <laughs> has to be just the essentials right I mean now I can hardly read adult books because they go on and on I'm like I want to edit this book you know <laughs> I was like come on let's get to this right so um it just dawned on me that maybe you can teach through books and that's when I was like oh can I do this? This is not something I want to do. Like writing, I mean, sure, I did it as a kid. I was a good student, you know, I did that. But it wasn't because I loved it. And that's when I found SCBWI, Society for Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. And that was just, you know, that's what taught me the business end. I mean, sure, I learned craft. But as a nonfiction author, uh, I had to look harder for the craft pieces that were dead on what I needed. Um I didn't know I was a nonfiction author at first either. Yeah, that took me a while to figure out. Um, I tried to write a novel. Uh -huh. I tried to write in rhythm and rhyme. No, but no, but you, when you say I'm I'm a nonfiction writer, that doesn't mean you know I I I've had a uh, a many many wonderful nonfiction authors on the uh, on the program. Um, some of them write the uh, fiction as well and some of them uh, haven't yet but why rule it out right well it's funny because you know most folks and myself as well um when you think of writing you, you think of fiction that's i'm actually a fiction reader but man i just like i can write fiction actually i'm working on a project now that kind of does some fictionalization but to actually use the true stuff and tell a story, you know, that, I love a puzzle. And and that's what I think nonfiction a lot of time is because um, I have to use what's real. Um, and so that's like a figuring out how to put those true pieces together to actually show the picture, the big picture. That's pretty fun. Okay, but we don't want to rule out that you might not you might wake up one morning and have an idea for oh, right. a... I think, actually, the project I'm working on right now is fictional. Be I mean, I'm trying it this way um, because I think the thing to remember as a writer, and sometimes I don't do this well, is that my first idea of the approach is probably not the best approach. 
And I have to play with different approaches to find some. Um, I can't remember what somebody said. Um, you you have to you have to let the research lead. And I think that's really powerful um, because we have it in what we think we know, and then we dive into the research and we find all kinds of different things. You know. That's so I, 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 I stopped you and I shouldn't have. So um, you learned your craft. SCBWI, of course, is uh, where I also and many other people uh, realized how much we didn't know and had to learn. Um, and but you, but, but you learned. Uh, how did you find an agent? How did you get published? So one of the early conferences I went to, I learned about this thing called educational publishing. And I was like, wait, what? So my background was in education, not, you know, typical classroom necessarily as much, but like I understand educational standards. Um, and so I met this guy, Lionel Bender, who was a book packager and um, looking to hire authors for certain projects. I was like, whoa, this is a thing. And I was like, I'm going to take advantage of this because I need to lean into my strengths, right? This is what I know. Let me, um, let me go this direction. So I did. And um, there's a whole different world. Um, in terms of writing for hire and how you prepare your package and all of that. Um, and so I got an assignment. It was it was how uh, to survive an earthquake. Yeah. I was like, really? Um, and they wanted a book that was um, engaging for a sixth and seventh grade boy, um, but was written on a fourth grade reading level. And I uh, get this, they wanted actual survival stories of boys from that age range who survived an earthquake doing the steps that you should do. That was a really hard project to figure out. Like, how are you gonna find these kids? Number one, they're children. Number two, there aren't that many earthquakes. You know, how, how are you gonna reach these people? So it was a challenge. And of course, the thing with work for hire projects is um, most of the books are in a series, so you have to follow a very specific guidelines. But I saw that as a as a like challenge okay can I do this and you have to include certain vocabulary and all of those things um so I did and that was my first uh my first project that um that went so yeah and so I actually have 10 books in that educational vein um and they taught me so much um, sure, they're not my idea. Sure, I wrote books on subjects that I wouldn't necessarily. Um, but as I worked with them, uh, I started to be able to pick and choose my projects. They would, they would, you know, aim closer to my genuine interest. But I was also careful because I knew I wanted to write original projects on, say, insects. So I did not take any work for higher projects on insects. Um, I worked my way up to where I was doing things like fact checking, or I was doing the design of a whole series as opposed to just writing a single book. So it's interesting that um, there's a whole different avenue there um, to to go and uh, to learn. Um, right? I also wrote test questions for uh, standardized tests. I can't actually tell you much more about that, but um, I can say it's the best pay in any other writing I've done. Um, it was also very, very challenging. My head actually hurt at the end of those days because I had to think so hard. So um, it, at some stage, uh, you went, you morphed from uh, mm. the educational to the, to the right. trade. Yeah. And I don't discount doing educational now. Like I like working on projects, but I've got so much on my plate right now. I can't. So how that happened? Heather, yeah. you, you, you've made the big time, dear. Yeah, You're working I, with the with with the best uh, publishers in the, the Kidlet the business here. Yeah, I am, I am very, very fortunate. So um, the story of how that happened is an SCBWI conference again. Yeah. So um, one of the things, one of the tricks is to volunteer um, and put yourself in a position where you're giving. Because we all know that we get as much as we give. So early on, um, I volunteered in my region, Southern Breeze, and ended up taking on a lot of roles. Well, one of the conferences, I was an angel. So an angel was the person who shepherded the uh, faculty around. Um, and I was an angel for an uh, editor who only edited fictional uh, 
easy to read books. Okay, I was never going to write that. So I wasn't nervous at all. We had a great conversation. It was awesome. Um, but then a little later, after the conference, we we made this great connection. She emails me and says, Heather, I moved to Scholastic and now I have to bring nonfiction to the acquisitions meeting. Send me something. I was like, I love this. I love this. This is the serendipity that happens. Um, and you Heather, her name, her name, her name, her name. Oh, Katie Carella. Amazing, amazing editor, Katie Carella. We're still good friends. Um, and so uh, that's when a book called Wild Discoveries came out in the book fairs. Um, and so the thing about that book is it was my idea, but it was still kind of, I mean, very much guided by what book fairs wanted. So because I had done the work for her, I understood how to write something that was going to fit in a niche. And a nonfiction book fair book for Scholastic is kind of a very specific niche. Um, and so that was awesome. And then I sold a second book to them. Um, interestingly, that second book that I sold to them, I had tried to sell to them earlier and tried to sell to other publishers. Nobody wanted it. And then a few years later, multiple publishers wanted it. And what changed? Not the manuscript. What changed was the industry. Because Common Core had come out, all of a sudden there was an understanding that, hey, we could have information books that had voice. We could let, you know, uh, let uh, facts be fun and humorous. And they were actually seeking that. And that's what that book was. It was it was uh, a, a lot of voicey voice, I call it. Um, and so, wow, I was selling books to Scholastic, which was awesome. Um, and so then that's where I kind of made the, the leap to, OK, these are my projects. Um, and this is my and honestly, these things just come out of me like it's just too, I, I just I tend to take these really oddball topics um, and like you said there's a lot of yuck in them right but I, I think differently than the world and I think one of my goals is to put books out there that are for kids that we haven't written for yet um, I think that a lot of kids that are quote unquote non-readers it's not that they're non-readers it's we haven't written the books for them yet a few, a few words about your Bugstone hug. Yeah, Bugstone hug. So that was another picture book. Um, I am a bug nut. I love, love, love insects. I want to put write so many bug books. I could write bug books if they'd let me. Um, but the thing is, there's a lot of bug books out there, right? And so, how are you ever going to? So, um, I learned a lot about insect parents. We generally don't think of insects. But, um, there's a whole group that do this parental care so I kind of got that as an idea that that was pretty interesting but it wasn't until I was out I that this really like flipped. so my friend Carrie does not like insects but her son does so her son Zachary and I would always go Bugs, and she would stand back. So I turned over this log, and there was this earwig, which is some people think is really creepy, right? With these tail things, and ooh, creepy. Um, and my friend was like, ooh, ooh, ooh. and I was like, oh, look at this bug! Look, it's a mommy. It was there with its young. And my friend was like, what? I was like, oh, look, did you know that this mommy's gonna go out and do the grocery and her kids? She's like, oh, what? I was like, yeah, yeah. And did you know? I'm telling you, uh, did you know that when they're eggs and they lay in the dirt, the mom picks them up every day and gives them a bath so they don't get dirty? And at this point, my friend was leaning over my shoulder, looking at this, like, oh, and I was like, bing, a light went on. I'm like, a picture book, a read aloud picture book needs really to be for the adult and the kid. And I had just figured out that the key to helping people understand insects was to understand how they were similar to themselves. And so that's when I really understood this idea. You know, a book about parental care speaks to the dog. Oh, so. Fantastic. So uh, listen, we're getting near the end of the interview, which has been great. And you've already given the best uh, advice ever 
to uh, to our authors who are listening and watching. Um, I'd like you to go back to your new book, which just uh, came out, uh, and uh, sick, sick, and 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 uh, read us a little bit of it uh, to get the feel. Sure. Um, let's see. I'll just start at the beginning. I think that's a good place. <laughs> Animals under attack. Just to warn you, it's a little gross. Just FYI. Because that's me. Projectile puke, showers of snot, days of diarrhea. At one time or another, we've all experienced some sick symptoms. And we've all dreaded that one word, infected. Infections are icky. Infections are tricky. Infections are caused by pathogens. When a pathogen is microscopic, some people call it a germ. When it is not, some people call it a parasite. Whether you call them, wh whatever you call them, everybody knows that organisms that infect human bodies are bad, 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 right? After all, a germ's got a job, attack, invade, destroy. But how do they do it? Excellent. Uh, Heather, this has been uh, fantastic. Um, I, <laughs> I really wanted to meet you. Uh, you are one of a kind. Um, and uh, and your books are, uh, even though they're yucky, they're also delectable at the same time. Thank and, you. Uh, to you. It's been fun. It's really it's it's is, really is, great is, to top shop. Is, is yeah. And is there anything I haven't asked you? Any advice that you want to share uh, that we haven't mentioned? I say for anyone who's interested in writing kids' books, I have three pieces of advice. I always suggest read at least a hundred books that are similar to what you want to read and recent books number two join a critique group and there was no critique group for me so i made one right actually i was i made three because i needed different critique groups for different things i needed an in-person one so i could cry on their shoulder i needed a non-fiction one so they understood and i needed a science one um and the third thing is uh join scbwi i mean i'm not saying it's the only way to go about it but to me, it's the most efficient way to learn the industry um, and and to connect with people who understand you and the challenges you're going through, because it's hard. This, this world of and it and just because you get a book published, sorry to say, it doesn't mean it's easy after that. Right. Um, we all still have the challenges of that the industry uh, presents us. But it's OK, because I always say those tough things in the industry just make us write better books. And that's what we all care about is the that only the best books get out there for kids because that's what we want them reading. Really good stuff. And not to give up and to keep improving your craft. Exactly. Never ends. It's great. It's a good challenge. Heather Montgomery, we've been we've been here celebrating you and your career and your your marvelous yuckiness and um, or ickiness perhaps as they say in America. And um, and to celebrate your new book, uh, Sick, out from uh, Bloomsbury in February. Um, you want to give the longer name? Let's give the longer name, Sick. The Hold Twist and Turns Behind Animal Germs. Yeah, wonderful. It's, it's a great book. And, uh, and of course, my other favorite, uh, What's in Your Pocket. Um, and um, wow, it was great interviewing you. So um, I'm just going to remember to say I'm Mel Rosenberg the host of the Children's Literature Channel of the New Books Network. And this has been a marvelous interview with Heather Montgomery, and I can't wait to actually meet you at some SCBWI meeting somewhere on the border of Mississippi and Tennessee, or Alabama and Tennessee. Thank you so much. It will be delightful when we meet in person. Thanks so much. And, and uh, go out and come back. And uh, folks, if you haven't seen Heather's books, have a look. They're, they're really wonderful. Um, so bye-bye, everybody else, and Heather, go out and come back, and we'll have a little tete-a-tete. -tete. Thanks so much. <laughs>